once again, it's my privilege to have two young men that are serving under me and to give them the opportunity to preach and get them their time in the pulpit to get themselves ready and prepared. Uh, you just never know what God's going to use them. He's already using them here, but you never know what God's got in store for them later on. And uh, like I said, I'm honored to serve with them and to, to train them a little bit. I want you to be in prayer. And Brother Brian, you come and preach what God's given to you tonight. Amen. Good to be here tonight. If you all take your Bibles, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Let's all look at 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 1. 2 Kings 6, verse 1. I heard a story about a pastor of a church. He asked his assistant pastor to cover the pulpit for him one Sunday. And uh, this is not Keith Hamilton, just so. This is someone else. So a pastor of a church, he decided he was going to skip church. He asked his assistant pastor to cover the pulpit. And the pastor secretly went off golfing. And Satan saw it. And Satan went to God and said, look at your servant, your, your pastor here. He's skipping church and he's on the golf golf field and he's golfing and God responded yeah I'll take care of it so before long the pastor selects the perfect club he gets all squared away he takes a swing and before you know it hole in one he was beside himself he can't believe he got a hole in one then Satan's observing this and says okay hold on a second he's skipping church now he's getting a hole in one he went it backed up to God and he said to God I thought you said you're going to take care of it. And God said, I did. Who's he going to tell? There you go. All right. All right. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse, starting in verse 1. 2 Kings 6, 1. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now the place where we dwell with thee, is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thee thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Tonight we're going to be talking about restoring the lost axe head. Restoring the lost axe head. Let's pray and, and we'll begin. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, thank you that you give me the opportunity to preach. I just pray that you use me now. I pray that your, your word will be made plain. Open our hearts and minds to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Restoring the lost axe head. These men of God had a good desire to serve God. These were prophets. They were learning at the feet of Elisha. They were even dwelling with him. They were trying to soak up all they could, all the knowledge they could, under his feet. They soon began to outgrow because his popularity has grown in the land, and uh, the place where they lived was too straight, meaning it was too small. They were outgrowing it. So they had a good desire, said, well, we don't want to leave you, and we still want to stick around you. We want to be at your feet and learn. So let's Let's build a bigger place. So they wanted to continue by his side, but needed more space. They did not outsource it. They didn't seek outside help. They all willingly volunteered to make this happen on their own. Uh, they probably didn't have much money. God's people, God's prophets were usually not well favored in society. They didn't have a lot of connections many times. They didn't have their own tools nor did they buy them, but they borrowed of their neighbor. These men had a desire to serve God. They had a desire to learn from a man of God. And they had a good thing in mind, that they wanted to do a good work for God. They wanted to continue in the service of the Lord. And they had good intentions, and they had a good spirit about them. 
and they asked to Elijah, Elisha, what can we do this? And they were allowed to go. They were commissioned. He said, go ye. So our first point today, we're going to be looking at three points, very simple points. Plugged in, power on. Plugged in, power on. They asked, and they were commissioned by Elisha himself to go and to do this great work. He wanted to be, they wanted to be close to Elisha. They wanted him to keep him accountable. They started off well, and they were very effective. They were working very hard, and they were making a lot of progress. Now, today I brought a prop, and I know, um, see here, I got a, an axe for visual purposes. Uh, Travis, uh, last, on Wednesday, he asked me to uh, try to hammer a nail into the pulpit with one hand. And I want to see if he can take a, sh a chop at this pulpit with one hand. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Um, for some reason, we just want to destroy this pulpit. I don't know why. Um, but this is, this is just kind of a, an example of probably what they had at that time. Now, this is a nice name brand. This is borrowed, by the way, from the pastor. Uh, so this is not mine. And um, this is an example of what it may have looked like. And we'll, we'll go back to that in a little bit. So they started off, they had a great zeal about them. And they did well. But somewhere along the line, one man lost his axe head. It fell right into the water. Boop. And he couldn't recover it. He had to stop working. He couldn't proceed any further. And if he thought to proceed, he would have been foolish. Can you imagine him whacking at this tree with a stick? He would look pretty foolish. He knew without the axe head, he could not continue the work that he set out to do. There's a lot of spiritual truth to these things. He stopped working. We can do spiritual things in the flesh. We don't yield much result or lasting fruit, though. You know, you can, you can do um, Christian service in the flesh. You can go soul winning but never had prayed. You can do it because you just want to be there, say, hey, I'm here, I'm, I'm ready to go. But you never spent time in prayer, you never prepared yourself, you never, you know, prepared yourself as a vessel and say, Lord, I want you to use me, speak through me. You think that you know the Bible good enough, you can just, you know, spew it out of your mouth and just see what happens and just kind of wing it. You don't ask God for help and you just, you lose the opportunity to do a lot of great things because you never prepared Although a Christian can never lose the precious gift of salvation, he can still have a power failure. He knew if he tried to continue without the axe head, it would be in vain. He sought for it to be in his possession again. So he called out to the only one that could help, Elisha, Master. Alas, Master. Now I want you to understand this. I want you to see this about that. He was especially worried about it because it wasn't his. He was very beside himself. He was, he was exclaiming. He said, alas, master, it's borrowed. He was worried about it. He didn't want to go back to that man empty-handed or half with it half there. It was someone else's. Somebody else purchased that tool. Now I want you to think about this. Let's say the handle represents our body. Okay, This body is right here represented in the wood. And we can say that this axe head represents the power of God. So this is our body and this is the power of God. This is what does the action. This is what does the cutting. This is what makes progress is with the power of God. Now, this was a borrowed tool. This was not his own. As Christians, we were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our body is not our own. Amen. We belong to Jesus Christ. So this is his. And do you think that you would present your body, Lord, here's my body, and he looks down and he doesn't see the axe head. You think God would be pleased? He says, I, I saved you. I bought you. I've shed my precious blood for you. You are mine, but you, have no, you don't have my power on your life. Why is that? Why don't you have my power on your life? I shed my precious blood for you, but yet 
you live unto yourself. You live to yourself. You see, God wants you to be filled with His Spirit. He wants to see His child live His life. He does not want to see His child live His life apart from the power of God. We are not our own. We don't have the luxury to live life as we see fit. We belong to Christ. And this is our life. And this represents us. And if we lose the power of God, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. And we're going to I'm going to try to break it down and show you how these things happen. The power left him. Everyone around him could see that the power was not with him anymore. He kind of just stood there with only the piece of wood in his hand. Everyone else is chopping away at wood, and they look over and say, look at this guy. What's he doing? Oh, he lost his axe head. He can't do anything. So they noticed he stopped dead in his tracks. He couldn't proceed any further. And he would look pretty silly if he tried to anyway. It was out of their sight. Only two people know where that axe head went. That was the very man that it happened to and God himself. Only two. That man and God. You know, a lot of times, people can tell whether or not you have the power of God on your life. But they can't always put a finger on if where you lost it if you don't seem to have the power of God. You see, we have secret sin that we do behind closed doors. We have secret thoughts and a, and a way of life that we live that people don't really always get to see out on display. But God's, God sees everything. Yes. And it's the things that are done in secret that God rewards openly. And if you, and if you prepare your heart, God will give you that power. You see, the people didn't see the cause, but they, they saw the result of the power loss, but they didn't know the cause. They couldn't point to it, but we do. We know exactly. We can probably point to exactly, this is why I don't have the power of God in my life. This is why, right here, and I bet the Holy Spirit's pointing to it right now. This is why. How did he lose the axe head? How did he lose the power of God? Somehow, as you know, how axes have, it got loose. If you ever took an axe and you looked at the top of it, you would notice it has a wedge. And right here, there's, a, there's one wooden wedge and two steel rings. They're hammered into this thing to where when it's hammered in, the wood expands and it holds tightly to the axe head. So this axe head's not going anywhere. Not unless these wedges come out or they get loose. That's the only way that this would fly off. So, the things that you do in secret. Disobedience. Neglecting the Bible study, Bible reading. Neglecting to pray. You are loosening the wedge that's keeping the power of God in your life. If you neglect the Bible, if you neglect prayer, if you neglect dying to self you are risking that wedge flying off. And eventually, that power of God is on its way out the door. Because you, somewhere along the line, said, you know what, I don't care that my body was bought with a price. I'm going to live for myself. I'm going to live for myself. And when you start doing that, you will see the power of God slip away from you. We shouldn't live unto ourselves, but what God would have us to do. You know, before he went out in the field, he probably should have took that tool and inspected it, you know, looked at it, make sure it wasn't loose. And uh, if it was, if the wedge was coming out, drive it a little deeper, make sure it's not going anywhere. And how do you do that? How do you make sure that the power of God stays with you? And that is by bearing yourself in his word, by praying, by staying faithful to him, like I said, dying daily, being where you're supposed to be on time and doing what you need to be doing for God. And a lot of the things that, that give us the power of God is all done in secret. Nobody sees it. Nobody sees when you are in your prayer closet with the door shut and you're on your knees. But that's where the power of God is. Is when you go to God and you pray and you beg God to give you the power. 
No one sees him inspecting this tool. Nobody sees back in his shop. He's taking it aside and, and inspecting, look at it, make sure it's okay, ready to go. But they did see out in the open what the result was when he lost it. So how did he get it back? First, he had to realize that it was gone, which he did immediately. It was pretty obvious. Usually, when we lose the power of God, you should notice it. There could be a period in your life where you, you know, you, everything you do, you just, God's hand is on you. He's blessing you. The people you talk to and witness to, they seem like they're ready and ripe for the picking, and they, they want to get saved, and you know, it's almost like they're running to you. What must I do to be saved? And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And God is just, you know, if you ever had that experience where God just blessing you, blessing you, bless you, and then all of a sudden, it stops. You know, maybe we need to examine ourselves. Say somewhere along the line, have I sinned? Have I done something wrong? Have I neglected what I was supposed to do? Did I lose the power of God in my life? Why did he take it away? Why did I lose it? So he had to realize it was gone. Second, he had to go to the only one that could help him, and that was the master, Elisha. So Elisha went up to him and he said, okay, where'd it go? And you notice he had a point to it. So what does this signify? He pointed to where the axe head fell into the water. And I believe that is signifying confessing your sin. When God looks at us and says, okay, okay, Brian, I notice that you notice that you don't have the power of God on your life. And now you're coming to me asking me for it back. But I want you to tell me where you went wrong. And you know exactly where you went wrong. So I need to confess my sin and say, Lord, it's right here. It's, it's right here. This is where I did wrong. This, this right here is what's keeping me from having your power on my life. So you have to point it out to God. You have to confess your sin. You will never recover your axe head until you tell the Lord where you lost it. So we looked at having the power on, plugged in power on, unplugged power off. Now we're going to go to the third point, plugged back in, power fully restored. See, this, this story ends on a good note. He did get his iron back. You know, it's very easy to lose that power because it's very easy to fall into the rut of sin. It's very easy to do what your flesh wants to do. You know, it's, it's easy to lose that power. It's easy to uh, just do what you want. It's easy to forget to read the Bible. It's easy to, do, uh, to, to neglect prayer and skip things and be unfaithful, counting your life dear to yourself. We must deny ourselves and take up his cross and follow him. Even though it may be easy to lose that power, it takes supernatural to get it back. As you can, as you can see in the passage, a supernatural thing occurred. Iron does not float, in case you were wondering. Iron sinks to the bottom of water. And I don't think anyone has ever seen this happen before. But this was a miracle that only God can do. Now, it's easy for us to lose that power, but only God can give it back because he's the one that gave it. But we must point it out and say, this is where I lost it, Lord. Please give it back. As you notice as we keep reading, Elisha didn't even pick it up and place it in his hands. He didn't, Elisha didn't go down there and said, okay, he's thro he throws a stick in the water, the iron begins to swim, it starts coming toward the edge of the shore, Elisha didn't bend down and grab it and say, okay, buddy, here you go. Don't do it again. No. He asked the man, go down there and grab it. So what is that signifying? So the man goes down there, goes to the shore of the, of the lake or the pond, whatever it is, and he bends down, he humbles himself, and he grabs it. Okay? That whole process of getting... God's power on your life, it's a humbling experience. You can't be full in your pride and say, God, I want you to use me. I deserve to be used. I demand that you use me. No. 
That's not how God works. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That man humbly knelt down and picked it back up. And his power was restored. To receive power, we must humble ourselves. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Before a Christian is spirit-filled, it is hard to do an easy task. But after he is spirit-filled, it is easy to do a hard task. Why, then, do we attempt to serve God without his power? Why do we do it? Why do we do it? It's like I would, I, I didn't grab one, but I thought to. It's like me having a vacuum cleaner, and I have it in my hands, and I'm rolling over this spot on the carpet, and nothing's happening. And I'm doing all the correct motions. I'm doing everything I know that's supposed to happen, but then I turn around, I notice it's not plugged into the wall. There's no power. You can go through the motions, you can do everything that you know to do, but when there's no power behind it, that's when you don't have the power of God in your life. You need God to give you that power. He's the one that gives the increase. He's the one. We do the, the work. We do the motions, the planting, the watering, but he gives the increase. Whenever there was a powder, at, whenever I, when I was young and there was a power outage, my mom, she would, she would immediately pick up the phone and call and let them know the power's out as if they didn't already know, but... Um, I just thought it was funny because we just, we don't, we know they know and we just wait. But she made sure she got that fixed. She was worried about the fridge, you know, and the freezer, all the food going to be ruined. But um, when you have a power out outage, you kind of weigh your options. Okay, well, what's wrong? Did a tree fall on a power cord? And you go look around your house and you see, well, there's no tree down. And then you start to look at your neighbors, okay? Uh, Suppose it's nighttime, okay, because it's hard to tell in the daytime. You try to look and see if any of their windows are on, the lights, the porch lights are on. Everyone's off. So you know, okay, it's not a tree that fell. We just lost power. So immediately, we all have the same problem. We all lost power, but there's only one source that can restore it, and that's the power company. And we need the power of God. All of us. But there's only one source, and that's God himself. We must go to him immediately. If we ever were to lose power, we must, with that same intensity, if you were to lose power in your home, you try your best to figure out what was going on. That's what we need to do in our Christian and our spiritual lives. When you don't have the power of God, you need to seek the Lord and get it back. Where did you leave your axe head? Where did you leave your axe head? It is right to be content with what you have, but never with what you are. God wants you to be spirit-filled, not satisfied with the status quo or a life of mediocrity. If your Christianity is worth having, it should be worth sharing. You need to do it in God's strength. As the musicians come up forward, and let's all stand. Let's all stand for a time of invitation. Music musicians make their way to the platform. Let's all stand to our feet with our eyes bowed, and heads bowed, and eyes closed. Let me ask you, are you disconnected from the power source? Are you operating in your own strength with just a wooden stick hitting against a tree? The invitation tonight is this. There are two that know where you lost that power. That's you and God. But it's your job to point to God and tell him where it happened. Tonight, there's an altar. And I invite you to come and say, Lord, this is where I lost my power. And God, I'm asking that you restore it to me. And he will, if you confess and humble yourself. Imagine that this, this altar is the bank of the water, and you bend down, and you humble yourself to grab that axe head again. Say, Lord, 
I'm going to humble myself and bend down and pick it up where I left it. And when I go back to my seat, Lord, I know I'll be forgiven and restored. If that describes you, I invite you as the music begins to play and Brother Ron begins to sing. Say, Brother Brian, that, that describes me. I've noticed I lost the power of God in my life and I want it restored.